Item 10. Ha uh, welcome Helen for the um, Three Waters report. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I just had a, um, a couple of points to raise in here. The, the first one is to note that the Central Government Water Reform Programme and the delivery plan has been submitted to Department of Internal Affairs, but we haven't yet heard back. They are promising that we'll hear back by the end of October. Uh, and just a reminder that um, that is about the 40 million grant. Uh, most of that's going into <coughs> water supply renewals or wastewater renewals across the city. So the water supply mains renewals are Rickerton Road, uh, out in Akaroa, and the main that supplies Littleton, so that goes up to the tunnel. In terms of wastewater, those are also across the city in Edgware and New Brighton, uh, Linwood and Hillwood. So there's, that's some extra work that will be coming. In addition, we've got the reduction of inflow and infiltration into both Akaroa and Devotials uh, wastewater systems, and that, of course, is in preparation for upgrading the wastewater plants out there. There's also some operational funding which will go into deferred maintenance of our pump stations, a um, comprehensive assessment of a number of our reservoirs across the water supply system, uh, and some extra work on CCTV of our wastewater system. So there's quite a lot of extra work there to deliver, uh, and we're all, we're all waiting and poised, ready to go with that. In terms of water safety plans, uh, you've been updated a couple of times uh, on the delivery of those uh, across the community water supplies that we look after. Uh, just to remind you that, if for those who haven't heard, that Judy Williamson is no longer the drinking water assessor for um, Christchurch. Uh, she's resigned and taken up another position. So our new drinking water assessor is Matt Parkinson from Y Comply. Uh, we know Matt and we've been working with him because he led the panel that assessed the Christchurch water supply, um, water safety plan. So we had submitted the Akaroa plan uh, to Judy and she had some comments on that and we resubmitted it in the middle of September but that has now gone to Matt at Y Comply and we are waiting on his response. So he has indicated that he's looking at a range of issues beyond those that have been flagged by Judy. So we will probably delay um, the submission of the Wainui plan until we've heard back from Matt as to what he thinks of the Akaroa plan. So the Wainui one was to go in in November, but we may wait a week or so uh, and see if we can get those other comments back. Uh, the Christchurch one, of course, is still due to go up in December, and we don't anticipate any delay with that one. Looking uh, at the out at the wastewater plant, we've just made a note there that um, midge season is coming up, so we're doing some planning to reduce the number of midges uh, over the summer period. It has been a very mild winter, so we are anticipating more midges across those ponds, uh, which of course the birds will love, um, but more midges than, than we've had in the previous couple of years, and we're doing some work on that. The, um, the big, in terms of the big capital program, uh, we've of course got the wellheads going and the upgrades to the reservoirs and the renewals across the water supply system, but we're also coming to the end of the Littleton Harbour wastewater scheme, so that's to eliminate all of the wastewater discharges into uh, Littleton Harbour, and it's good to see um, that, that work progressing. The other one that people are aware of is the Chewham Street brick barrel, uh, which ran into a few problems, so um, when we were repairing what is virtually a heritage item uh, down, uh, down Chewham Street for the wastewater. They did encounter some problems, um, but, but they've got their methodology back on track for that one. And the, the, the report updates you also on the extensive stormwater basins in the upper Heathcote. Uh, and anybody who's been out there will see that those uh, stormwater basins are not only doing a great job in terms of uh, flood mitigation, looking after the quality of the stormwater that's coming uh, into, into the Heathcote River, but they're also providing a fantastic recreation resource uh, and ecological benefits. And when we come to talk about the waterways, uh, some of that we may touch on. So I'm happy to take questions, uh, and then I'll hand over to Belinda to talk about the waterways report. Thanks, Helen. Sam. Just one quick one, Helen. So in terms of the change of the water assessor, you mentioned there were potentially more issues raised. Uh, or, or there could be more issues. Are we worried about consistency between assessors in terms of what that might do to delaying our work even further? 
No, we're not worried about consistency because uh, central government and the Ministry of Health have indeed been having an oversight of all of the plans to ensure that consistency. However, I think what's happened is that because Matt has to sign this off and approve it, he's starting from first principles, so he's taking the time to do a thorough assessment uh, of the report right, rather than just accepting Judy's list of outstanding items okay, and checking so those off. So it's just taking a little longer. Right, OK, but in terms of what he's assessing against we'd be pretty comfortable that there wouldn't be too much of a change in an approach. I'm reasonably confident of that because they have had this oversight of, um, of other water safety plans and the drinking water assessors across the country to ensure that consistency. Okay, so then just the last one, is if we did have issues with that, is there a, a mechanism or a, a way forward to, to challenge, um, I guess, his approach or are we literally stuck with that assessment? So as part of the assessment, there's always an ongoing conversation. So there'll be a number of uh, questions and we'll always be given the opportunity to respond. So it is a um, it is a good process and we have worked very well with Matt Parkinson okay. before. So I'm quite confident that we'll work well with him on this one. Perfect. Thank you. I was just wondering, Helen, when you talked about the, I think it was the water main repair in, in Edgeware, can you tell me what streets that, do you know? Uh, I can come back to you on that. There's a number of streets affected yeah. for the water main there. Because of course we've just had all the, the downstream effect. I promise I'm not digging up ones that were um, <laughs> okay. resealed following the downstream effects. Yeah, We've right. checked that. Maybe it's Caledonian Road or something like that. Okay, thank you. And on page um, 113 mentions the mayoral forum that's um, working with Canterbury Council to develop a request for proposal on a regional service delivery review. Is there a timeline for that? We uh, have to get our information on, in, on that today. So that work is underway, and once that information has been collected, then they'll go out to, to the market for that. So I'm not sure exactly of the dates, but it's underway. So who's involved <coughs> in that? <coughs> so why Makariri Selwyn, obviously us. All Anyone? of the Canterbury Councils. So that's who else? Just those three? Or no, no, it? all no. of the Canterbury Councils, so all of the territorial authorities Urinary, in the council. Kaikoura, uh, Ashburton. 13 of the mother, yeah. yeah. Waimati, oh, no. uh, Waitaki. Waitaki. 13 um, of them. Mackenzie. That's great. Oh, wow. Okay. We are expecting, we, we, we have been waiting for an RFI to come from the DIA, a request for information, because they are doing a nationwide study in two parts, and we're not sure whether we're in the first or the second part of that. At this point, they originally indicated we'd be in the second part, but that may have changed. But we are waiting for that. We did expect it last week, um, so we're waiting, and that's a lot of information required. So we'll just have to see how we can resource that. So if our part of that is going in today, is everyone else's in, or do you know? Yes. Yeah. Well, so I understand it is. I'm not collecting <coughs> the information, but I understand they have the same deadline, so I'm assuming that this will be in today. Will that be discussed when the mayoral forum meets again? There or will be an update report to the mayoral forum. That would be the side of Christmas. Yes. I'm just thinking yeah. timelines because I know that the tranche two emerges and will by June next year, so I'm just wondering how it's playing out. Yes. The, the Merrill Forum have um, are going out for a professional services contract to have a look at the impact and what's the best model for the region. And so this information that we're giving them is going to be the foundation information for them to pass on to that professional service deliverer who will then do the report Mm. And I think the deadline of the report back to the Merrill Forum, maybe February, on something like that. There's, there's a quite a tight timetable on that. Yeah. It's a pretty challenging piece of work in a short time. Well, keep us posted. I think one of the helpful things for this council is that we participate <coughs> in the Water New Zealand survey uh, of our water services, so that we do have up-to-date information. Uh, and that, that is and that is recognised by central government is quite helpful for those councils that participate. Right. Thank you. I think we've circulated the Hawke's Bay equivalent report. They went early. Um, so again, if you're looking for the kind of output potential you may get, have a look at the central or have a look at the Hawke's Bay uh, water reform a report done by Morrison Lowe, I think. Um, it's online, it's on the DIA report. But I imagine that we will get something similar at our regional level. OK, that's helpful. Feel free to send us a link on that if anyone wants to. OK, I'll get um, David to send you the link. That would be um, really good. Yep. Um, questions, Melanie, then Yanni. Um, I'd heard 
through probably you, Pauline, <laughs> that um, there had been a, um, a water safety plan in New Zealand that had actually been signed off. Do you know um, how many around New Zealand have been? So we've heard of one, and that's for the Huranui Council, for the Colverdon supply. So the Colverdon supply is a very small supply, uh, and it's a supply that does have residual chlorine. So it's um, right. it's one of the one of the more straightforward ones okay. to be signed off. But yeah, congratulations to Huranui yep. for being the first. That's helpful. Mm. Yanni. Um. I, I know I sound like a broken record on this, but I'm, I'm just looking at page um, 136, and that's the water jobs um, completed. And what I can see in July and August, um, I mean, it's not quite double, but it's, it's a massive increase this year compared to what we had last year. Last year, we struggled to keep on top of it. Um, I'm really concerned. Like, we're being told that City Care and the staff are working to implement a plan but I do think we need to actually understand what's going on. And previously, when um, we've asked questions about this, we also asked if we were recording the reasons why things were failing or leaking, and we were we were assured that we were. So I really had two questions. One is, um, or three questions. One is, when are we going to be able to see what that plan is? Um, the second question is, has the introduction of chlorine had any impact on the network? Um, and the third one is... Um, what is the time frame now for people that ring up for a minor, for a non-urgent leak and an urgent leak in terms of a response? Thank you. So the um, if I start at, if I start at the end, so the time frame for urgent leaks are um, are within hours. So urgent leaks and that threaten you know, ongoing supply are responded to as quickly as possible. The non-urgent leaks, which generally are the ones at the meter box that you see on the footpath that um, can be a matter of five days if it's a relatively straightforward fix and a repair. Uh, if it's a replacement of the meter, which we are doing more of, then it, it is a number of weeks and we don't meet the levels of service that, that we have in the plan for that uh, because it takes a little longer to do that. Um, but one of the other things about this massive increase is um, a lot of that is about the backflow work that's happening across the city at the moment. So we've sent letters out to um, to our commercial connections, and we have over 8,500 commercial connections, to advise them that they need to put backflow in place, um, and in some cases that we'll come and do it for them, or could do it for them. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of responsive work and requests coming in around that backflow work that have uh, artificially raised those numbers over and above the usual service requests, if you like. So yes, we are preparing a report for you that um, separates out that backflow work from the ordinary um, service requests and the leaks work, and we'll get you some information on those times for repairs. I think the, um, the, the, the issue with the water meters is that putting in a, a new water meter, the, the plan there is that that prevents us having to go back and fix a second, third, or even fourth leak at that connection because we replace the whole assembly. Uh, it also assists us in terms of better backflow prevention at those connections. So the, um, that, that water meter replacement program is something that we are continuing to drive. So it gives us multiple benefits. I guess the problem that I've got, what I don't understand, is what's causing all the leakages? And do we have good information about, is it you know the skirt repairs that weren't up to, to standard? Is it um, the chlorine going through the system? Is it just the age? Of the things, do we do we have any sort of intel over what's actually causing the huge number of leakages? And I guess in particular, when we're, I presume we're going to ask for people to conserve water over summer. So, you know, I think it's pretty critical we understand what's going on mm. and have adequate resources to fix the leaks as soon as possible. Because if we're going to ask people to save water, I can't see how I can't see how they would feel like they should do that when we've got leaks going when for we've got, yeah, weeks. When we've got visible leaks in the system, that's right. And that is, that, yes, that is a difficult thing for us and one of the reasons why we, the um, proactive meter replacement, we're hoping will reduce the number of ongoing leaks in the future. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, uh, but we are hopeful that it will continue to trend down. But we'll, we'll separate out those numbers for you. Uh, in terms of the reasons for it, um, there's, there's no evidence that chlorine has caused um, leaks at those connections. Most of them are indeed very elderly meters, 
Um, we've got a lot of uh, stock you know, back from the 40s and 50s across our network, and those all do need replacing. So I think that's mostly what it is. There, there's very little in the way of skirt repairs at metres and laterals. So it's not, a, it's not an issue with skirt repairs. Right, thank you. Hey, just a question on the um, midges. Do they um, like fresh water and salt water? Mostly fresh water, as I understand, but you're probably better to ask the ecologist. Oh, I could ask her when she comes up. Um, are there any more questions on Helen's report? Yeah. We need to formalise something over the water leak issue. I mean, I, you know, I'm a bit worried that we may need adequate more resource going into it. We need, may need to make some level of service well, adjustments. Well, that's a question for Helen. Is the hold-up uh, due to lack of resource, or what do you, what do you need? Uh, yes, some of it is lack of resource. Um, but is, that, is that manpower? Or we're doing as much money? as we can, um, you know, within the people and the budget that we've got available, uh, and that's why we're trying to look at the smartest way possible to address those leaks. Um. Is, is, it, is it manpower or the or the parts themselves? What is it? It's budget, just so the money. Yeah, yeah. So you've got you've got the meters, you've got the the people to put them in. Well, and it's all capacity as well yeah. within city care. So they have geared up to do more work. Um, we have cleared a whole lot of the backlog, um, and we cleared some of the backlog through COVID as well, which was helpful. So what's the timeline to get that program completed? Uh, that'll never be completed. We will always be doing reactive um, meter replacements well, and water leak repairs. So the, if you look at the, um, the water supply uh, maintenance contract, 80% you know, of it is reactive maintenance. So we'll always be responding to leaks across our network. It's, it's not that we're not going to go out. It would be extraordinarily expensive to go out and replace meters proactively. Um, that, that, that wouldn't make good sense. <coughs> we'll, we'll come back with a memo about the, the number, if we know what causes there are and um, what's the kind of typical average time of um, replacement at this point. As um, Tim's put in the report or Helen's put in the report, City Care are addressing more of that backlog, so we will see. Um, but yeah, what's the level we need to get it at? There will always be an ongoing level. What's that appropriate level? Um, that's a real. Okay, well, as Yanni's saying, it's actually one. the time frame yeah, to. We'll We'll yeah. get that in there as well. Okay, well, if, no, that's yeah. his issue, that when you get a call because of the leak <coughs> and the problems that are meter, can we reduce that time frame for the, getting it fixed? I think that's correct, and I think one of the other things that we, um, that we would like to do is when we've made a decision as to whether or not we're going to go and do a repair within a matter of days or a meter replacement within a matter of weeks, yeah. that we get back to the customer and let them know that uh, so, that, you know, so that people's expectations, we manage expectations really. But I think, as Yanni is saying, we don't want it to be a matter of weeks. We need to bring that into, uh, you know, a matter of days. So how can we do that? Well, and what yeah, do you it also need? it also has to be cost effective. So what we try and do is batch the meter replacements by area. So it's a cost effective. So you still you, you and I think I think most people, if you say to them, look, it's not a simple fix. We're going to come and replace your meter, and we're going to do it, you know, within this period. I think most people will be pretty happy with that. Yes, I know, but it's not a good look <coughs> when we're, we're, we've got a water conservation program running in parallel. That's the, the downside of that. Mm, mm. So I think. But we do, we do need, need to look after value for money for that rate payer dollar. Yes. Yeah, so what you're saying is you wait till you get a whole lot in one area and go in and and bring efficiencies by doing a whole lot at once. Re Recognising if it's a gusher, we will deal with it immediately. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Urgent urgent leaks that interrupt supply, we're straight in. Um, yep. <coughs> So big leaks like that that are damaging the road surface will be attended to. It's right. different to um, seeping at a metre. Right. Yeah. OK. So Dave's going to send a memo out on how you might be able to accelerate that. Thanks, Yanni. Good questions. Aaron? Yeah, it's just a follow-on from Yanni's around um, the public are asking the questions a lot around the why for the leaks. And I think we do need to be really clear about where they've come from. Because coincidentally, especially the Toby boxes, um, just the sheer number uh, it seems unprecedented and coincidentally seems to be around the same time that thousands of cylinders in Christchurch have gone kaput as well. So of course people will start stories but it's, 
Well, you can put your head in your hands, but I can, you want to just ring some plumbers. They'll tell you the numbers they're doing. So, Helen, is um, that correct that the, the leakages have gone up since the coronation from the metres, necessarily? Uh, I'd have to have a look at the numbers to Yeah, and um, if it's not correct, that. we need to be really clear about that. We need to get so, because these are the stories that people make up, so we need to address those rather than wait until... Of course, simply get some interesting facts. Yeah, some, get, some, get some facts, yeah. <laughs> All right, so can we get you to put that in the memo as well, Dave? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure we've supplied a, a report like this probably 18 months ago, and I'm sure it was a mixture of causes. There was not one. But look, I will re get that information from our, um, from our staff and, and recirculate that. Mm. Great, thank you. I think one of the other things we can do is map where these um, failures are across the city, but my understanding is that they're right across the city. Um, so in areas that have never had chlorine, as well as areas that do have chlorine. So, um, right. But we can we can review that. I think I raised this last time, but you know, a lot of people won't even know to look in their Toby box. So maybe if we wanted to get on top of, and I know it will create more work, but actually encouraging people going into summer to have a look and see if the Toby box is Starting filled with clean. water. So. You know, because just simple stuff like that could give us a lot greater intel about the scale and the size of the problem. Mm. Mm. So we we are also rolling out a um, so following the um, following the discussions about excess water use and water meter replacement and likely changes um, and options to consider in the long term plan. We are rolling out quarterly reading of meters, so we will get more up to date <coughs> information if we've got leaks at those meters. So we will pick those up through the quarterly readings as well. Okay, that's great. So we'll look forward to that memo again, Dave. Thank you. <clears throat> and again, I think you'll see the trend is we get a lot more complaints January, February, March, just because the ground becomes dry and so they're a lot more noticeable. Yeah. And that's the trend of every year. Um, so I'm um, expecting them to ramp up again. Mm. Well, it could also be because we're pulling more water through the system as well with the gardens. All right, any more questions? So we have a resolution up there to um, receive the information in the Three Waters report. Do I have a mover for that? Anne, and a second to Sarah. Any more discussion? All right, well I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much, Helen. Appreciate aye. that. And Belinda will... Yes, now we have Belinda's presentation. Have a look at the Health and Waterways. Yes. Welcome, Belinda. Uh, tina koutou, kua hui hui mai nei i mihi ana ki nga mana whenua. Tina koutou katoa. Kia ora. Uh, so thank you for letting me, to be honest, invite myself along to your <laughs> meeting today. Uh, I wanted to start um, by just giving an outline of what I wanted to cover. <clears throat> the reason I wanted to come is there's been a few things that have been happening nationally and also within council that I think are important for our community outcome for healthy water bodies. So the first is the Ministry for the Environment Action Plan for Healthy Water Bodies. And then we have our council surface water monitoring report, annual report and our waterway report cards as well. <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some good news stories and then about how to improve water body health. Um, but I wanted to finish, I'm just going to briefly touch on these things because I really want to just spend a little bit of time just in a korero so we can talk about the issues and um, collectively have a talk about how we can work towards this community outcome. So for the MFE Action Plan for Healthy Water Bodies, there's a number of um, vehicles, so to speak, that have been changed. So there are amendments to the 2007 National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. So though they include things like expansion of Te Mana Otiwai, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in following slides. Strengthening of iwi and hapu involvement, mapping monitoring of natural wetlands, fish passage, which is a great one to have in there, so it's making it more formal. Um, and either new environmental attributes, so there's things like uh, sediment and fish and macroinvertebrate attributes, which are new for this round, um, and then amendments of previous attributes such as nitrate, which if anyone's aware of 
PC7, that's an important thing. The plan change 7 for the land and water regional plan. Uh, then there's the National Environmental Statement for Fresh Water, which gives limits on farming use. Um, activities relating to natural wetlands uh, and reclamation of rivers, and again, fish passage, fish passage, focusing on construction of new culverts, weirs, flat gates, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's also a brand new uh, NES for stock exclusion, and there are amendments to the NES for water takes. Um, you might be interested to know the difference between an MPS and an NES, because I certainly had to look up on that one. So an NES is uh, regulations under the RMA and they provide certainty about rules nationally for specified activities and they prevail over district or regional plans unless um, specified. Whereas the NPS are instruments under the RMA and they give objectives and policies for matters of um, national importance <coughs> and they can give direction to local authorities. So, so Mana Otiwai was strengthened in the 2020 NPS. Uh, I won't read this, I'll just give you a moment to read it, but that's um, a, a definition in the NPS of what Te Mana Otiwai is. So one of the key things which is uh, come through with the Te Mana Otiwai is there is a hierarchy of importance when it comes to managing waterways. And this is something that's really new and different, I guess, to the RMA where it's a balance of all um, needs and requirements. So number one, health and well-being of water bodies and freshwater ecosystems. That's number one. So that's a really key important thing to um, know about this NPS amendment. Then comes the health and needs of people, and then following that is the ability of people and communities to provide for their social, economic and cultural well-being both now and in the future. So that one's going to be a really interesting one to see how it plays out. Uh, and so there is a little bit of uncertainty how these things will progress into our day-to-day -day lives, but um, uh, with the NPS and the NESs, you would imagine that they'll need to be incorporated into uh, regional plans, so the Canterbury Land and Water, Water Regional Plan. Uh, and then that will flow down to affecting things that we as a council do, such as resource consents. So, for example, that might be something to do with fish passage, which we you know, need to do already, but it may be strengthened. So then I now wanted to move on to our annual surface water quality monitoring report. Now um, this can get a little bit heavy, so please feel free to interrupt me if something doesn't quite make sense. So uh, you may be aware that we have a very detailed monitoring program, so we monitor 42 waterway sites, uh, and it's always handy to have this um, stat of uh, greater than 11,000 tests so that people can actually see the significance of the work we're doing. So it's monthly sampling at those sites. And for um, the calendar year last year, the 2019 calendar year, 20% of samples exceeded guidelines and 98% of sites exceeded at least one guideline. The contaminants of most concern were nitrogen, E. coli, zinc and copper, but there were some issues with sediment at other sites, such as, for example, Kashmir Stream and Hayton's. Uh, there's just a link down the bottom on this slide too to the full report if you wanted to read it. I was just going to show in these next few slides just some snapshots of those contaminants of concern. So what I'm showing here is actually this really <laughs> neat uh, dashboard I guess we have on our website. So all our monitoring reports are up on our website. You can see the link there. Um, but we also have this Tableau dashboard where you can actually manipulate what you want to see. So uh, hopefully you can see this, but what I've actually done here is just taken a screenshot. So I've looked at nitrogen. So you can pick drop down menu of what you want. There's a map of our 42 sites. And then they're color coded with um, uh, gray not meeting guidelines and green meeting guidelines. And here we have a graph across the different catchments, so our five major catchments, Orokaikino, Linwood Canal, which is only one site, so that's important to know, um, uh, Hallswell, 
it's very hard to see, Heathquit, Heathkit, Avon, and Styx. Um, so, but I don't want you to get lost too much in the detail. I just wanted you to know that if you, you can manipulate this, it's quite a, a neat wee tool. And then you can just, if you look at the graph straight away, you can see, you know, we do have issues with nitrogen in some catchments and more so in other catchments. And the other cool thing is this table up here, which tells you the percentage of all our sites that either meet the guideline or do not meet the guideline. And then it can tell you changes over time, which is really great. So of the ones that meet the guideline, those are improving those are remaining stable, and those are declining. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. So like I said, I'm just going to briefly, I could get lost in this, so I'm just going <laughs> to briefly touch over it. So that was um, nitrogen, and then um, this is E. coli. So you can see there just the difference between them, that E. coli really is an issue everywhere. Uh, and then we've got dissolved zinc. Dissolved zinc really does follow this thing that uh, has been coined the urban stream syndrome, and you may or may not have heard about it. But in a nutshell, it means that um, water quality and other things like flows within waterways uh, are impacted more so in urban environments as opposed to more rural um, environments. Um, so this is just a great example of how that's playing out because you've got Utapaikino on the left of the graph, which is more rural, and then you've got um, towards the end the Heathcote and Avon, which are more urban, and zinc uh, predominantly comes from tyres, from car tyres. So this is just a great example of the urban strain syndrome and um, uh, zinc, so zinc is a concern in those catchments, but it's also quite very toxic to biota. I thought it was copper from the car tyres. Uh, zinc, zinc and then the copper roof. from the brake pads. Oh, oh yes, right. Yeah. And also I guess you get zinc from the roofs as Correct. well. Correct, yes, in, as well. In a yep. built up area. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and so this one is copper. Mm. Uh, what we've also done is because the report is quite heavy to read, we create every year a summary brochure. So I've got some here for anyone who wants one at the end. Um, but it's just an easier way to explain to the community the results of the water quality monitoring. We, we try and do it every year. It's a fold-out brochure. Um, but it also has a lot of things in it that the water quality report doesn't about what we can do collectively to improve water quality. So that uh, map up there is from the summary brochure. Uh, and it, yeah, it's quite big in the brochure, so... It might be easier to look at that uh, afterwards, but what we do is create a water quality index for each site, and that gives us a category of whether the water quality is very good right through to very poor. And this map here just has those colour-coded dots. So those red dots there are poor. So again, if you look in the lower catchments, I don't know if you can see my cursor, yeah, in these lower catchments, Avon, Heathcote, more urban, they have more red dots then further up, which you can't really see, these are green dots around here, so it's better quality, a better water quality index score. So, so, most so then do you just take an average of the three contaminants that you mentioned? No, we look at everything, and yeah, we've created... Give it a score. Yep, yeah, that's right. So we based it off a Canadian index, okay. and it, it, it's quite complicated because it's not just about what succeeded, it's how frequently and by how much. So the water quality index um, rated most of our sites as poor. The worst catchment was the Apawahu um, catchment. And the lowest water quality, you can see the sites there, Curlet Stream, um, two sites in the Heathcote, and Hayton Stream. Um, the Urukaikino River was the best catchment, and the best site was in the Styx River at Main North Ro Road. Um, this is just another manipulation from that Tableau dashboard, which looks at the water quality index. So you can see over time, this one here looks at the number of sites in each of those categories. And this one here looks at the change in water quality index over time for each catchment. So there are lots of ups and downs at sites. Um, some improve, some don't improve, but overall, generally, because there's a lot of overlap in these bars here, we're not, we're, for the most part, our water quality is staying stable, so the good news is not getting worse, but it's not getting better either. 
So the recommendations in the report were, not surprisingly, that Hayton Stream and Curlitz Road Stream should remain the priority for stormwater treatment, and we're working on that as part of the Comprehensive Stormwater Network Discharge Consent. Uh, and also the middle tributaries of the Avon or Takaro, so Rickerton, Addington and Dudley. Uh, there is also a recommendation to look at some investigations into the sources of phosphorus. We've never really looked into that before, but it's quite widespread. Mm. Um, we've also seen some initial changes in conductivity and salinity in the Heathkit, potentially due to the, the dredging. So we just need to keep an eye on that as well, because any changes in salinity and conductivity may result in some effects on the environment because of that change in salinity. Uh, and the big key thing that we talk about, but we probably, I think, is one of the number one issues we need to tackle, is how are we going to reduce faecal contamination? Because if we want to have swimmable rivers, basically that is the key issue. And predominantly, as you can see from this photo as well, predominantly we know from the studies we've done that that faecal contamination is coming from uh, waterfowl. So there's obviously a community um, conflict issue potentially there with um, Ha, you know, having the presence of waterfowl and being able to swim in our rivers. Um, I also put in a recommendation about developing a waterways action plan, which I will touch on in the next slides. We also every year create waterway report cards, again in an attempt to try and get some of that heavy science into something that's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, and so again, I've got some here for one for each catchment here, if you like one afterwards. And it combines that water quality index I was talking about, a sediment quality index, because the, this, the quality of the sediment, what's trapped in the sediment is important. And then also a macroinvertebrate index, because they are great indicators of the health of your water body. Um, if you've got sensitive species there, then you'll likely have a more healthy water body. Uh, so for the 2019 monitoring year, the Otakai Kino River uh, scored a B. Sticks River C and the other catchments recorded D. So again, that ties in with the urban stream syndrome. And I might take the opportunity to say, you know, this is really common. We're not doing anything different to anybody else around the world. It's urban, um, it's urban issues that everyone is dealing with around the world. We're, we're no different. And in fact, you know, we're really doing really well with our monitoring and thinking and getting through, um, hopefully getting through, achieving that community outcome eventually. So good news stories, because I know some of that is a little bit depressing sometimes. Um, so we have many threatened Mahinga Kai species in our waterways. So this is something that we really need to remember. We haven't passed our tipping point. There's still a lot going on in our waterways, and it gives us a lot of hope that if we improve the health of our water bodies, that we will be able to um, you know, really get those th um, species to thrive even more so. So we have Waikota. We have kākahi, we have tūna, we have inaka, just as an example. Um, but also we have some really important spawning grounds for some fish species. So uh, kanakana lamprey, it's a picture up there on the top left. Um, it's really hard to find spawning sites for lamprey. You, you uh, Niwa struggle to find them, and we have one in Christchurch, which I'm sure you probably all know about because mm. it's resulted in um, <laughs> effects on a council project. Um, and also we have one of the most expensive, uh, expensive, expensive inaka spawning grounds uh, uh, nationally. So because of all those reasons, we have many sites of ecological significance and Naitahu cultural significance under the district plan. And then this also feeds into the zone committee priority catchments, both for Christchurch, West Mountain and uh, Banks Peninsula. Because of course, I've only just talked about Christchurch City, but there is Banks Peninsula as well. Um, how to improve water, bo water body health. Um, so on the left of this slide is just a snapshot from the box and this summary brochure which has a whole list of things that you can do to help improve water, water body health. So that's things like making sure that you don't wash your car on the driveway and have that zinc and copper end up in the stormwater system. And then, and here it explains, stormwater system ultimately goes to the waterway because we all know that that is also an educational thing that we need to work on. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things there, so I won't go into them specifically. 
Um, and so the second bullet point on that slide relates to that better, um, also getting better community and, um, education and involvement. Um, and as we know, the community are really keen for this. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is something a little bit novel that um, is something that is a little bit close to my heart, something I'm trying to push at the moment, is developing a waterways action plan. So we have this uh, community outcome for a healthy water body, and I know what that means to me, but what does that mean to you? And what does that mean to you? Have we actually defined what a healthy water body is? So for me, I'd like to see lots of fish and invertebrates and a thriving biota in the waterways, but you know, you may want to go and swim in the waterway. And that's quite different because you could have, that's just making sure the E. coli levels are low, but if you've still got copper and zinc in there, that can be toxic to fish. So that's not going to achieve my goal for water body health. So it's about understanding what is it we're trying to achieve, everyone's trying to achieve, and then also working out what are the different levers that we need to pull to achieve those goals. So for example, if you go with the goal of um, improving biodiversity, uh, we have a lever, of course, for reducing stormwater contaminants. And that's a really important lever because um, stormwater contaminants have toxic effects or can affect another way, biota. Um, but it could be that we could remove all contaminants from stormwater in a, in a lovely ideal world and maybe we still won't reach our goal because we've, we've drained a swamp land, we've channelised everything and we've taken away a lot of the habitat that these fish and species need to thrive. So if we we probably need to have a lever as well about habitat availability. And if we don't pull that, then we won't get to our overarching goal of improving biodiversity. Uh, and so the idea of this plan would be to understand what those levers are. And also you may push, uh, you might spend a lot of money pushing a lever and it might not do a lot really for the amount of money that you've spent on it. Whereas you might pull another lever and it really has some significant um, results in the water body. So that's something that I think would be really useful for us to um, get a handle on. And we, as part of the comprehensive stormwater consent, we need to um, have an investigation about when we would expect to see a response in the receiving environment. And um, this is something that I'm thinking about doing first because it ties all into that. Because when you expect to see a response in the receiving environment when you pull the stormwater lever, might be affected by whether you pull the other levers as well. So, uh, also, of course, capital and operational projects. We um, need to keep on with our treatment and prevention of stormwater and other discharges. Um, there are huge lag effects to doing that kind of work. So, it's going to look like, um, I, you know, there'll be some short term gains, but maybe it will take a while to see those gains. We have to keep positive on that. Um, waterway planting and restoration, this is a big one. I think that's the lever that we need to do more pulling of. Um, and then also reviewing um, practices just to make sure that we're doing things as best as we can to um, improve water body health. So example would be that slide on the left, that's um, removal of aquatic vegetation. And sometimes we might remove um, fish when we're doing that. So we need to have an understanding, do we remove fish? Is there a better way we could do it? Because if we do remove fish and we look at that pile, that's um, a little bit worrying. So we just have to and I kind of have a look and think, could we do things better or do we even need to do things better? <coughs> uh, and the other picture on the right hand side is, um, I hope you'll find interesting, I don't know whether it's just because I'm a wee bit nerdy about it, but this is a waterway restoration project and you would have known about it as well as in the Kapatahi. So we realigned um, the waterway, the council paid for um, the majority of that I think to avoid that stretch of waterway being piped for a significant distance because of the um, motorway. Um, and so that's actually construction of fish habitat. So this is construction of the channel before there's water in, and then that's a log that we've embedded in the bank, which creates an overhang and a hidey hole, and basically a location for fish to hide, um, using something that would naturally be there. So that's what I want to talk about today, uh, and then I'm just really keen to have that corridor. Well, thanks, Linda. That's really interesting. How does the um, how does this fit in with the community water partnership? Y yes, um, that's an issue, yeah. I am probably not the best person to respond about that. Clive Appleton is the person mm. that's involved in doing that, but it's very integral. 
Um, and that was identified in the comprehensive stormwater consent and that's why that's come out as part of an investigation project or condition as well as part of that. Um, but yes, Clive Appleton would be best to give and, you a and brief you, on that. Do you work with him too? We yeah, we do work closely. Yeah. I think it's I'm not sure where it's um, at in terms of getting off the ground. I don't think it's as easy to get off the ground as maybe it, it, you would think it would be. But I I am hoping that it will start. Yeah, yeah. I mean because you've mentioned the community participation a lot in here. Yes. The zone committees focus on community participation, exactly. and so does the water partnership. It seems yeah. to me these three things should come together yeah. and, um, and, and get the best benefit of that that we can. And also, you identifying the priority areas are really important too. Yes, um, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, um, the Zone Committee have in the past, they every year they get this talk, and actually I'm going yeah. to the next one, the 20, 29th as yeah. well, so they'll have an update. So I, I my understanding is the priority catchments like Addington and Rickerton have yeah. been based on this. They're still there. I think yeah. they diverted some from the um, Haytons over to Otakaikino, which was just starting to degrade, and they thought, yep. we'll get in here and arrest that degradation quickly, um, rather than wait till it gets really big. So there's that kind yep. of mentality as well to, to yep. play with. Yeah, and the, you know, they're really good with that. That was, yep. um, yeah, I, I helped push that yep. one, so. Yep. Yeah. So questions, Andrew, Tim, Yanni? Thank you. I've got two questions, Inside. if I can. Um, you make the comment, um, of course, there's Banks Peninsula as well. Yes. Um, I note that all of the monitoring sites are in Christchurch yes. rather than on Banks Peninsula. Um, so I guess there's a question as to, as to why that is, but probably of greater concern, um, the improvement actions, the initiative for improvement, are they all in Christchurch as well, or are some of those on Banks Peninsula? And I guess... That begs the question, if not, why not? Yeah, so um, traditionally this monitoring was under past consents, which were things like the STIX, Stormwater Management yeah. Plan. Yeah. So with the new comprehensive stormwater consent, there are sites now that we are monitoring in Banks Peninsula, um, but that monitoring only began this year. So from next year we will be reporting that. Um, also, that consent is only limited to, to settlement areas, so where there's a stormwater network. So um, there are not very many sites because of that, because it's the, either the, there aren't many uh, settlement areas or some of those waterways in those settlement areas don't flow all year round, so they aren't possible to monitor. So I think we have about six surface water quality monitoring sites around that number, so not too many. But we also now have some more coastal sites, both um, within Christchurch, for example, in the Avon Heathcote estuary, and uh, over in Banks Peninsula, like Akaroa. Great, thank you. And then second question, um, to what extent is this work reported to or joined up with the work of the zone committees? Yes, so uh, Every year I go and uh, present this information to them and uh, we work collectively, we, well, we work as, uh, collectively throughout the year between ECAN staff and CC staff and then that f folds into the zone committee as well. And I know they have individual working groups so we are available to help with that as well. So I feel like there is um, no gaps in knowledge in terms of, I feel like the information is free flowing, but maybe Pauline would <laughs> have a better response on that. But um, yeah, and I must also say, I forgot to mention, which I think is important, with that Waterways Action Plan and the goals, in the back of my mind, you would start with the Canary Water Strategy Management Targets and Goals as well. Great, thank you. Right, so when you say you're going to the Zone Committee on the 29th with this presentation? No, so every year I usually just do a summary, and I, I, yeah, I have it here. It's more of a catchment summary. So I, it goes into the agenda meeting, and then I yeah. basically just be there for the discussion part. Well, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do this. Yeah, well, it's already written, yeah. Why um, not? Well, it's good to see the visuals as well. I think it helps people understand yep. it. Yep. Um, Tim? Uh, thank you. Just a couple. Um, so I, I presume you're working in with the Pawaho River Network. Is that... Yeah, so uh, we, uh, we as Christchurch City work with them, I guess, and the Water Community Partnership will be a big thing for them. I work with them um, on and off, but that's, I don't spend, I spend the majority of my time doing the monitoring and, 
and making sure the results are right. So there's only a sort of a small part personally for myself, but the council does work with community groups as well. We work a lot with community groups for restoration projects. Mm. So uh, we work, for example, with Kashmir Stream Care Group. Yep. And so, of course, that ties into the Apalpo Hathcote River Network Group. So thank you. Um, and do you also know, some time ago, Ekin um, was struggling to monitor the sediment runoff from building sites and so our building inspectors have been doing that and yet they're not warranted so they can't really do anything about it, they can just report. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, has that moved forward at all? Do you know anything about that? Because I'm just looking at, obviously this is a major issue for the Apawaho and, mm -hmm. and it is mentioned in the your report mm. as a, a major issue. So I'm just wondering, there is a gap there and I was wondering, does anyone know about when it's going to be filled? Yeah, again, I only have a cursory understanding, but we can certainly yeah. get uh, somebody else involved in that to give you an update. If we could get that, that would be good because it just seems a bit ridiculous. Oh, Brent. Oh, Brent. Brent. I just to be here. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for dropping in. Can you come up to the table, Brent, please? Sorry. Uh, there is a fairly detailed staff project underway at the moment, working pretty hard on filling that gap, and it's partly related to the conditions of the comprehensive stormwater network discharge consent. Yeah. Um, control of the um, sediment runoff from those building sites is a really important part of that. Um, there has been a problem with the monitoring of those sites in the past, and so um, uh, Buster's team are working pretty hard yeah. on, on set <coughs> filling in that gap. Yeah, and, and I mean, and, and I know that, but there was a comment made some time ago that ECAN hadn't warranted, because they've got the authority, but our Buster's team are doing it to, mm -hmm. to assist, and it has been poor, but they haven't been warranted by ECAN. That's my understanding. And so, can you. Yeah, the, the, the solution they're working on doesn't require that warrant from ECAN. It it's, it's this council doing it in order to achieve this council's mm. uh, statutory obligations under the Building Act. So and do, you, do you know the timeline <coughs> on that? Because it is a major issue with the guards of our power. No, I don't, but I can find out. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah. Theanks. Thanks, Tim. Yanni? Then Mike. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to check. Um, so the Littleton Whakarapo Harbour Catchment Plan, is that, like when you talk about waterways plans, I guess I know that's sort of um, possibly different, but is that the sort of thing that you've got in mind or is, have you looked at that as a kind of example of something to do to address holistically the impact on waterways? Um, I know, yeah, so I was more thinking of it as more an overarching, I guess, um, approach to managing waterways, whatever the catchment. <coughs> But we will have to have some consideration on differences yeah. between catchments. I guess the frustration from where I sit is to see Heathcote continually be labelled one of the worst yeah. and yet just not seeing any tangible action. And um, I, I mean, it's just kind of knowing where to start because, you know, we've been on walkabouts with the Zone Committee and we get minutes from Zone Committees and we've got um, the Global Stormwater Discharge Consent, which doesn't seem to address, I guess, some of the more holistic approaches that we might take. Yeah, I totally agree and I guess that's where my thought was coming from for that plan. But of course right. there's also cross agency issues as well. Um, yeah. and having that community buy in as well. Okay. Yeah. Can I can I just ask like one really dumb question which is like we've got these rivers and we've got just a district plan that controls activity, land use activity. Have, have you looked at the district planning in terms of what we might be able to do to improve the water quality? Like, is there any relationship between the types of activities that we're enabling alongside the rivers and the water quality that you're seeing? So I think for the district plan, uh, I was involved in the review, um, but primarily centering around waterway setback consents. Right. So that's building, filling or excavating within the defined setback of a waterway. And I think that's really important um, because that's where you get encroachment on the waterway, mm -hmm. replacing uh, where a functioning riparian margin should be. But also that covers realignment as well. So I think that's really important. Um, but there is always a constant battle between needs as well. Um, 
but uh, I, I, unless there's a district plan review and there's something specific around that, everything else is sort of not really something that I'm involved in. Um, but we do also have our stormwater bylaw as well. And again, I'm not the best person to be talking about the bylaw, but I know that that is meant to also be a vehicle to help with right. um, discharges as well as obviously the comprehensive so how, stormwater like, concern. Say like the Hefka Apawahau River, how much setback do you think we should have? Well, it's all defined already in the district plan, and it varies depending on the location within the Heathcote. So you have a larger setback uh, in the lower reaches <laughs> because uh, the setback assessment matters are not just to do with ecology, but they're also amenity, landscape, and flooding. So uh, obviously down the lower so reaches. So Tunnel Road, like that tunnel, I guess I was really interested in that Tunnel Road but being really bad yeah. and what we could do to address that. And I know there's a lot of development happening there and there's been a lot of yeah, issues. Yeah, um, it's... But it's also at the end of the road, so to speak, so it's collecting everything that's, right. that's coming from the upper catchment. Um, but it's one that, um, with the comprehensive consent, we'll be going into a new way of doing things as well from next year, where if, um, if there's an exceedance in the attribute levels in the consent, we will have to do an investigation. Right. So, for example, we will be looking at why Tunnel Road had exceeded. So I think that will give us more information, hopefully, um, to answer questions like that. But at the moment we don't, we just know this is what the water quality is like for this report. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, Mike? Thank you. Uh, firstly, excellent presentation. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions, because I, I guess we know that the estuaries are the dumping ground of the rivers and and obviously that's under the regional council's remit but in terms of the water quality in the estuary is that being measured and how are the two i guess linked so uh, it can do measure water quality in the estuary yeah. um, uh, most of it is around summer recreational times uh, as i mentioned before we've got a couple of extra sites that we've added as part of the new consent, stormwater consent, which are focused around stormwater outfalls, but we don't have, next year we'll hopefully have some information from that. Um, yeah, so that's what's happening. Um, and then there's, uh, we also uh, get some data collected on the sediment and the biota and the estuary, which you can use as part of their reporting. Okay, but do, do you think that the two are, I guess, well enough connected between like, because we're obviously doing a lot of work in the water quality of our of our rivers, um, which is really important. But obviously we got the estuary, and, which is also I guess it gives us a really good idea as an overall picture how we're doing with our water quality of all our rivers together. Because obviously the catchments flow into one estuary and another one fur further up. But I'm just wondering if if we're well enough connected between the the two councils to make sure that we're doing it together? Uh, well, the estuary and rivers monitoring is part of an overarching document that was written um, quite a few years ago to make sure that our two, ECAN and CTC, are working holistically. It was um, done with the Avon Heathcote Estuary Trust, I do believe. Mm. So it does need a review now with the new consents, but that really is... I guess one of the vehicles to make sure and we do make sure that we're sharing knowledge between us but it does it i guess having two authorities in charge of you know the waterways from the rivers and then the estuary does that actually create complexities i guess it does but i think um, we have to be clear on the distinction in that um, we are doing this monitoring as part of mitigation for um, the activities that we're doing, like mm. discharges of stormwater. And ECAN are doing monitoring to understand the state mm. of the environment for regional reasons. Um, I guess we're unique in, well, um, I don't know if we're purely unique, but we're different than most other regions because we have so many waterways because we built on a swamp. Mm. I mean. I don't think there's any other territorial authority that has two waterways, ecologists, let alone one. 
um, because we've got so many waterways. And so we're doing a lot of the state of environment monitoring where in other regions ECAN would be doing a lot of that. So there is that, um, there is, I guess, that complexity. Um, but I feel like we are working quite well together. Okay, thanks. Um, it's just a very difficult beast. I wish I could give you better answers, but it's such a difficult yeah, beast yeah, no, to realize. deal with water quality and improving health and then also like i said it could take time to actually see that what you've done has yeah. worked um and so i guess that actually might lead on to my next question i guess it's you know when you look at the rebuild one of the things we've done is we've put a lot of swales and obviously clean the stormwater runoff and that before it goes into to the river so are we seeing anything as in terms of improving water quality from that type of action or is it just too early to well, I think if you look holistically of what's going on in a catchment, we're hoping that we will see those um, changes in the water quality report. But we also have other measures to look on a more specific um, site location. So we have investigations that look at um, stormwater treatment facilities and how well they're performing. And we're just sort of kicking off a lot of that stuff with a comprehensive consent. So that would be... Um, a more robust way to see exactly whether a um, device is doing what it's intended to do. Um, and also the other thing we're um, doing is looking at targeted wet weather monitoring. Wet, wet weather monitoring is quite difficult to do because you have to be storm chasing um, and the lab has to be open to give the samples to, which, you know, so it's always at night on a weekend. Um, and the monitoring that we're doing here is whatever the weather. So we're hoping that some of the targeted wet weather monitoring will actually start to see some changes. Because okay. that's when the stormwater is, that's when the contaminants are. Mm. Um, it, whereas when we do the baseline surveying, whatever the weather, you know, we might we might not see that. Although, as you can see, things do hang around. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and just one last question, because there's obviously a lot of different things that can actually pollute our waterways. And I, I guess if, if you could choose one thing to actually get the, the biggest <laughs> improvement to our waterways, what would that be? Does it have to be related to water quality? Anything. <laughs> I am a big believer that um, sediment is one of our key issues because it's it's in stormwater, and it um, so it has aesthetic mm. effects mm. if anything, mm. which gets people upset, rightly so. Um, sediment um, in the water column affects respiration, all yep. sorts of things of, um, of uh, fish and invertebrates living in the waterway. But also then sediment settles yep. and then it covers and chokes the stream bed and you've all, you've all seen what it looks like. And then when you look around, you see what we're doing and why it's getting in there. It's very obvious. Um, but I have to put a cautionary note that we are on a swamp, and so we're not necessarily going to be seeing the Banks Peninsula big cobbly, bouldery streams. Um, you know, for example, Kashmir Stream, where we're doing some of the restoration works. You know, we're thinking about, hey, well, it was naturally soft bottom, so let's not make it hard bottom. Yeah. Um, because that's also we're aiming to get some more Waikato in there, so we need that those soft banks. Um, and then I guess if you, um, but I also think we're, we're not focusing enough, focusing enough on habitat. We're channelising everything and there's nowhere to live if you're a fish. Thank you very <laughs> much. Mm. Melanie. Mike kind of stole my question, but it was going to be more specific about um, the, um, you know, Kerlitz, um Road Basin and, and whether that in the um, Wigram Basin have improved anything in Curlitz Road Stream and Hayton Stream and leading into the Heathcote before it gets to Cashmere Stream. <laughs> can, you, can you tell that yet? Uh, so we've only just started kicking off a monitoring project which is yeah, part of that targeted wet weather yeah. monitoring. Yeah. So we're looking at the Curlitz and Haytons because they are the priority catchments mm. and of course that the extensions or new build to those um, stormwater devices are relatively new. Yeah. So it yeah, could take time. But um, we're getting some 
fancy auto samplers and other things and focusing on the catchment and working collaboratively with the University of Canterbury and ECAN. So we'll monitor all at the same time, um, but they'll have their own sites with their own devices, which means that we have really good bang for buck. Cool. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to seeing that. And the goal of that is actually to pinpoint to hotspots. So it's not just to see what's happening. Part of the project is to help with the project looking at stormwater treatment. But the other part is actually to um, pinpoint hotspots so we can actually start saying, well, hey, <coughs> these are the pipes where something's dodgy is going on. This is where we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, trolling some things, um, some sort of new devices and things like that. Cool. Yeah. Great. Ian, thank you. Um, we're thinking about Haven Stream and, and um, Hewlett Stream because they're in my ward and there's a lot of concern about them. Yeah. And um, just wondering how we could connect young people to getting involved um, in, in, in sort of almost adopting, you know, some of these yeah. areas. There is a lot of interest and there's a lot of passion and I'm sure that, you know, we could do a lot. Yeah. Um, and I know there are models for it in other parts, but I'm just wondering where we, where we would start with that. Yeah, so again, um, I guess that comes back to... Uh, ECAN and the Zone Committee and they're working with some mm. projects with that sort of thing yeah. and then I think there's a lot of periphery things as well like I think there's a nature agents program where uh, one of the consultancies works actually with schools and helps them sort of look at a monitoring location um, and have buy-in um, I think Drinkable Rivers are doing that as well there's a few community groups doing it um, and Drinkable Rivers are more the Avon yeah. Yeah. The, the head of the Avon. They're focusing yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, they're working with Phil and Maria, I think. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully the community water partnership. So I think there's a lot of things there, and um, we've talked with ECAN before about also we're making sure that everyone's working. We got to pull them all together. Yeah. Helen, have you got a comment? Yeah, just just to add to that. So um, Department of Conservation have been part funding a position within parks and education, working with schools. And we've actually picked that person up on a temporary basis and extended her contract to, um, to bring together the community water partnership and the schools work yeah. around um, exactly that. So having the local schools working in the local streams. Uh, and we've um, just developed the job description and it's about to you know, go through the bureaucracy of job sizing and all the rest of it. And then we'll advertise that position to continue working with young people yeah. and the broader community and mm -hmm. link that to Clive Appleton's work on Perfect. the um, comprehensive consent. So, yeah, that work is mm -hmm. underway and we're building on the work that's been done because, of course, parks have a very strong partnership, mm -hmm. community partnership mm -hmm. going. Do you have that's an update good. on the community partnership? Uh, no, not specifically, but we, we are continuing to, to move that forward. Because we've got to sign up to it yet, don't we? We've endorsed it, I believe. We've we endorsed it, but I don't think we've gone through the sort of ceremony of signing yeah. it. Yes. And I think ECAN's the same. But so that's, would, that's excellent news. It is. Would it be possible, Pauline, to have a bit of an update when that kind of, you know, on progress with that position and once it's sort of in place? That yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll, um, we'll get Clive to give an update on that. Thank you very much. Perfect. Well, thank you. That's a good report. Yeah, there's, there's a lot, um, it's a bit like the recycling, there's a growing interest in, in our waterways. And I went to a good meeting the other night out at, um, it was the meeting of landowners in the Otakaikino catchment. And yes. um, what's it, Arthur Edcock had uh, convened it, he does these ones. But there must have been 40, 50 landowners there, all willingly there and all doing things with their property, sharing information, because of course they adjoin boundaries. So they're all sharing projects, and um, you know, it's really, really good to see they're all passionate about the land, yeah. um, and the, and all that sharing the challenges like the willows out there are a challenge, and the fencing, and changing from heavy-footed cattle to lighter sheep that don't have such a pugging effect on the land at certain times, and a myriad of things that they can do to improve the water out there. So it, it's just so good to see. Where really was that? Is, oh, it was at the. Um, Papua Nui Service Centre, where we have our um, the famous Papua Nui and Best Community Board um, in the city meetings. Mm. Number one, yeah. All right. Now, do we do have to do anything with this? It's just that we don't receive. Do we receive it? It's just part of Helen's report. Yep. Um, oh, we have, <coughs> have we so received Helen's report. That, yep. yet? I think you've done all. Okay. Yeah, we've done that. Hey, Belinda, thank you very much for the fantastic work you're doing, and and it's just great to see that data presented in that way. It's very clear.
So we'd love to see you back again any time. <laughs> Invite yourself back. <laughs> Sam? Do we need to provide any formal guidance at the end of that, or was that really just a discussion? It was for discussion, really, but is there something you wanted to...? Oh, no, no, I just wondered, yeah, because yeah. we're still in the meeting. It's for information. Okay. Yeah. But as Anne said, we've picked up a few things to follow through on this, so particularly figuring out how all these things are going to work together with the partnership and the zone committees and the, the DOC and our people and the ranges and all this work going on, it's phenomenal. But the data is the key so that we can get some indicators and see where we are improving or whether we're not, and I'm sure we are. Yeah. Do, sure. do you want any of the links that Belinda's talked about? She's got some hard copies there, but there's links to all those reports on our website and things like that. Do you want any of those? Some of you may want to incorporate them into Facebook or something, I'm not sure. Are they useful? Um, the yeah, data well, yes. she was manipulating, you can manipulate that all yourself on site on oh, yeah. uh, online if you wish to. So yep. maybe it just maybe that'd to the highlight good. pages and a yep. quick description might be useful. Yep, that'd be great. All right, thank you. Well, that brings us to the finish of the meeting today.